Hey everyone, uh, Armando Fox here, computer science professor at Berkeley, and I wanted to put together a couple of short videos on the best practices that my GSIs and I have learned for creating great quizzes and exam questions. This is based on material that I've developed for when I teach CS375, which is teaching techniques for computer science, but my hope is that the advice here will be generally applicable in other fields as well. So from a student's point of view, what makes an exam question good or bad? A good question tests concepts rather than testing if they've memorized something that they could look up. In a moment, we'll talk about the Bloom taxonomy and the Solo taxonomy, which are two different but related ways of evaluating where a question falls relative to that criterion. Students like partial credit if they can demonstrate what they know, even if what they know is incomplete or not fully correct. Students like questions that avoid multiple penalties. So a question that has multiple parts, but is arranged in such a way that getting the first part wrong will inevitably cascade a penalty down to subsequent parts uh, is a sort of multiple whammy because there's no way for the student to demonstrate partial knowledge if they make a mistake early on. What about from the instructor's point of view? What makes a question good or bad? Questions that separate students by level of mastery are good questions. Uh, you want students to get a question right because they know the material, not because they were able to, uh, in some lucky manner, uh, fake their way to the answer. And conversely, if a student gets a question wrong, you want it to be because the student really doesn't have a solid grasp of the material, not because, for example, the question was poorly phrased or ambiguous or admits of multiple solutions that maybe you didn't have in mind when you created that question. Questions should be orthogonal. If you've got multiple questions on an exam testing essentially the same knowledge, a student who is weak in that knowledge area will disproportionately suffer and students who are strong in that area will disproportionately benefit. So having an exam that really sorts the different knowledge areas you're trying to test and tries to avoid repetitive coverage of certain areas at the expense of others. Another great thing for instructors is uh, having an exam that can be unambiguously graded in a reasonable amount of time. There's a lot that we can do with machine grading and we'll cover some of that, but if the exam has parts that are going to be manually graded, it's really important to come up with rubrics in advance that cover as many possible cases as you can think of and make sure that evaluating a possible response with respect to those rubrics can be done in a reasonable amount of time, uh, especially if you're using great tools such as Gradescope. <coughs> <coughs> there are two pedagogical taxonomies we can look at to evaluate what level of cognition a particular question is asking. And as a general rule on an exam, you should be aiming for the higher levels in these taxonomies. The first and possibly better known is the Bloom taxonomy, which focuses on the way the question is asked. And the four levels, although there are variations of the Bloom taxonomy where uh, one might specify five levels, but the four levels we generally distinguish are recall, which tests if you remember a fact. So for example, who painted the famous painting Guernica? Understanding, which tests whether the student uh, has some knowledge rather than uh, understanding, which tests whether the student is able to say something salient about the subject rather than recalling a fact they read in a book. So for example, describe what the Guernica painting is about. What is its subject matter? Uh, and of course, in that case, you can just show them the painting. Apply, which asks whether the student is able to put what they know about a particular topic in context relative to another topic. So for example, relate the themes of Guernica to some current event. And finally, evaluate or analyze, which also uh, includes synthesis questions where the student has to create something. And this asks whether the student is essentially able to sort of deconstruct uh, the concepts behind some piece of knowledge. We might ask, for example, for the student to talk about the compositional principles used in the painting Guernica uh, and how they inform your opinion of that painting. Now, I'm deliberately using examples from non-STEM courses, but comparable examples in a STEM course, recall might have to do with, for example, programming language syntax. Understanding might have to do with whether students can demonstrate that they uh, can describe the consequences of, let's say, a particular line of code. Um, apply might ask whether students can choose which of several approaches uh, to creating a piece of code is the most appropriate, and evaluate, analyze, or even synthesize could ask the students to write code that does a particular task. 
a different approach is to use the SOLO taxonomy, which stands for Structure of Observed Learning Outcomes. And where the Bloom taxonomy focuses on how the question is asked, the SOLO taxonomy focuses on what kind of answer or outcome we're trying to elicit from the student. So going back to our example of the Guernica painting, the lowest level of the solo taxonomy is unistructural, so-called. So who painted Guernica? Very similar to a recall in the Bloom taxonomy. Multistructural uh, asks the student to sort of go outside a particular fact and demonstrate some understanding. So uh, for example, outline at least two compositional principles used in the painting. Uh, relational, which is similar to apply in the Bloom taxonomy, uh, wants to elicit an answer from the student that shows that they can relate facts or knowledge about a particular topic to other topics. So relate the themes in Guernica to current events. And extended abstract, which is analogous to evaluate or analyze, uh, where the student is asked to delve a little bit deeper and essentially deconstruct things about an artifact. In this case, uh, what do you think Picasso was saying via his painting of the Guernica? So what are some examples of how you can use this to target higher levels of cognition? Um, I'm going to use an example from economics. There's a particular principle in economics called Ricardo's principle of comparative advantage, uh, which has to do with whether some people in a society who are highly skilled will contribute relatively more to that society by focusing their efforts on the things that they do well. Uh, so a recall level in the Bloom taxonomy or a unistructural level in Solo might just tell the student uh, or ask the student to state what is Ricardo's principle of comparative advantage? Write it down, kind of like writing down, you know, Newton's first law of physics, of mechanics. Uh, a more sophisticated example, which would be an example of apply or in the solo taxonomy multistructural, would ask the student, which of the following is an example of applying the principle? So now they have to know not just how to write the principle down, but can they recognize uh, when the principle is being applied? We can go up another level to the evaluation or relate level and ask the student to essentially apply their knowledge of the principle to compare multiple situations. So use Ricardo's principle to decide which of these scenarios would yield higher overall economic productivity. And finally, uh, the analyze or evaluate the highest cognition level in, in either taxonomy might ask, we might ask the student using an appropriate economic principle, decide which scenario yields higher economic productivity. So now we're not giving the student the fact that a particular principle should be applied. We're asking them to go farther and identify based on context, which principle should be applied and then demonstrate that they know how to apply it.